Okay, welcome back to part three of three of uh, our, my discussion of Gapinski's Healthcare Finance, uh, Chapter 4. Uh, we have been talking about the balance sheet, and we will now be moving to a discussion of the statement of cash flows. Uh, and this is the last of the four statements, financial statements, that we are going to discuss uh, in this book. Um, so, the statement of cash flows uh, combines together information from the income statement and the balance sheet to create um, an income statement like report uh, that focuses specifically on cash. And um, as the slide shows, it's, it's designed to answer a couple of questions. Where is the cash coming into the business? Where is the cash coming from that's coming into the business? Is it coming from retained earnings? Uh, so from the operations of the business, or is it coming from um, uh, uh, borrowing, and uh, borrowing and lending uh, to the business, or is it coming from you know, the purchase or sale of, uh, of, of property uh, uh, by the business? So, and, um, and then we're trying to answer, where does the money go to? So if the money comes in, where does it go to? How is it, how is it allocated? And then finally, how much cash does the organization actually have? And this is, uh, uh, right, remember, this is actually a, a more complicated question that you can't answer simply looking at the income statement and the balance sheet um, because of the nature of, nature of accrual accounting. So we count something like, we count sales, um, so we count, uh, you know, fees charged for patient visits as revenue, but that doesn't mean that, that we actually have the cash on hand when we capture the revenue uh, amounts for the visits, right? Because sometimes there's a 30, 40, 60 day wait, and sometimes we don't get paid at all um, uh, uh, for stuff, for, for services that we render. So all of this is really important to kind of get a handle on for the business because at the end of the day, you have to pay your bills in cash, right? And if you can't pay your bills, um, then uh, you, you run into lots of trouble, right? Including bankruptcy. So uh, the statement of cash flows is like the income statement is a flow document, hence cash flow, right? As opposed to a snapshot in time or a stock um, uh, statement like the balance sheet. Um, the, the statement of cash flows is divided into three sections that deal with the inflows and outflows uh, uh, of, the, of cash into the organization. So the first, um, the first portion of the section is uh, cash flows from operating activities. So that's that, you know, so that's the core business um, of the organization. So where is the, is the, uh, how is the cash um, how are the cash balances of the organization changing as a result of operations? Then, how are the cash flows changing as a result of investing activities? Um, and investing activities, in this case, refer to the purchase and sale of um, property, plant, and equipment primarily. Uh, and then how are cash flows changing um, as a result of financing activities? So this is borrowing and lending uh, for the organization. So um, the bottom part reconciles the change in cash. The final portion reconciles the change in cash uh, on, uh, 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 on the statement with the cash account on the balance sheet. So it's a little bit like the statement of changes in owner's equity. Uh, well, you know, we'll have a starting cash and an ending cash and the change, the total changes in cash uh, gives us, you know, the, the, the change from our beginning situation to our ending situation. Um, so, uh, so the first section, I said three sections, three core sections to the statement of cash flows. The first is uh, cash flows from operating activities. Um, and so we start with not quite the end state, but close to it. Um, and that is operating income. Um, so we take the operating income, which if you remember, is the operating revenues minus the operating um, 
uh, operating expenses. So these are the operating revenues from the core operations of the business. So if this is a healthcare delivery organization, like a hospital or clinic, it's going to be your patient services revenue, um, plus any kind of ongoing uh, activities that are, are peripheral to, um, but supporting uh, the core, you know, patient service business. So again, like the cafeteria, uh, parking fees, and so forth. So we start with the operating income. So Sunnyvale in 2015 had operating income of $3.7 million. Now, we then do a series of adjustments uh, to the operating income to, uh, to, to add back or remove uh, changes in cash that are a result of the core operations of the business. So the first thing we do is we add back depreciation to the operating income. So depreciation is a, is a operating expense. Um, and so we have reduced our operating revenue in part by depreciation. But if you remember, depreciation uh, is a non-cash expense, right? It is meant to capture and better clarify the economic value that the organization is producing in a given time period. But there's, but it's really kind of a nominal uh, placeholder uh, to kind of keep us in check and thinking about how much value the organization has 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 actually created, um, and not allowing us to use an asset um, like a building, for example, for free, right? Even though we're not actually spending any cash on the building, we maybe we paid for the building ten years ago. Um, but we are uh, capturing the depreciation, the, the amount of economic value that we use up in a given time period. So in 2015, um, Sunnyvale took $6.4 million in depreciation. Um, so we have to add that back because we've subtracted it from revenues. And there isn't, it isn't an actual cash expense. So we add that back. So we start by adding that back. So we add back 6.4 million. Now you'll notice a number of these uh, numbers have parentheses around them. That's accounting, um, uh, accounting standards for instead of having a negative, um, when we have a negative number, we put the number in parentheses. So we're going to subtract 2.4 excuse me, 2.5 million um, as a result of an increase in accounts receivable. So why uh, um, would we subtract 2.5 million if we had an increase in accounts receivable? Well, remember, we are booking our revenue when, it, when the services are rendered. So a patient comes in, right, let's, let's do our our, our simple family medicine patient, we're able to bill $100, the allowable amount is $100. The patient spent $20, uh, gave us a $20 copay on the day of service, and we've billed out the other $80 and we're waiting for it. So that would result, you know, so that transaction would result in an increase in, of, of $80 to the accounts receivable for the organization. But we've we have already captured the full hundred dollars in our revenue, right? Um, even though we only actually got twenty dollars in cash for the um, for the visit. So eighty. So if our accounts receivable increases by eighty dollars, it means that our revenues are overstating the amount of cash that we actually have on hand as a result of our operations by $80. And so anytime the accounts receivable balance increases, what it means is we have um, uh, build out stuff that we haven't received, build out for services we've rendered and we haven't received the cash yet. So our revenues are overstating how much cash we have on hand. And so when we see an increase in accounts receivable, that means, yay, we did, we did some additional uh, uh, work uh, and we expect to get paid at some point, but we haven't yet. And that means uh, because we've estimated uh, our operating revenue based on, say, that extra $80, 
um, we have to subtract that extra $80 back away. So my example of the $80 would have been, you know, we were up, we had an, an increase of $80 in accounts receivable. Um, that means that our operating income is overstated by $80, uh, or not that the over operating income is overstated, but the cash on hand that we're estimating based on the operating income um, is overstated by $80. So we have to subtract it off. Okay. In a similar way, if we have an increase in inventories, um, and that means that we have, we have spent money uh, to purchase our inventory, to purchase, um, uh, you know, that $10,000 box of supplies, for example. Um, uh, but when our, invent when our inventories increase, when we purchase our inventories, we don't charge ourselves for inventory expense until we actually use them. Okay, so it's possible for us to have spent ten thousand dollars on buying inventory uh, in two at the end in December of two thousand nineteen, um, and we don't actually use the inventory until January of twenty twenty. Uh, we wouldn't count that ten thousand dollar expenditure as an expense in two thousand nineteen because we haven't used it yet, right? According to accounting principles, um, uh, we we match our expenses to our revenues. Well, if we're just sitting on the inventory, um, then we haven't generated any revenue with it. So, it's, so we don't count it as an expense. We count it as an expense in January when we actually provide care and use the inventory to provide care to our patients. So when we increase inventories, there's a hidden, there's a hidden outflow of, um, of cash that's not showing up in the operating income, right? Because the operating income would only reflect if we had used the inventory, but because we have an increase in inventory, we've bought more inventory and we haven't used it yet. Um, uh, and so even though it hasn't generated an expense uh, in terms of an expense we would put on the income statement, it, it did in fact, uh, uh, we did in fact have to spend cash on it. So an increase in inventory results in a decrease in the amount of cash available to us. Now, what about this decrease in accounts payable? Like that sounds good. We all want to pay off our debts, um, but a decrease in accounts payable. So accounts payable, remember, is when um, a supplier sends us that $10,000 box of supplies and says, hey, pay, us, pay me back in 30 days. And so basically they're giving us a free loan um, for 30 days. We're always going to have a balance of, of accounts payable. We're also going to always have an, a balance of accounts receivable and a balance of inventories uh, as well. Um, but if we have a decrease in accounts payable, what that means is we've, uh, we are basically reducing the number of loans that we have from our suppliers. So if our accounts payable goes down, what that means is we've paid off a bunch of those credits that we had from, um, from our suppliers. So when accounts payable goes down, uh, it reduces the amount of cash. Or in order to make our accounts payable go down, we have to spend cash. Um, so a decrease in accounts payable results in a decrease um, uh, in cash on hand. And then an increase in accruals, right? So this is like our employees uh, and we're paying our employees uh, uh, or this is our employees payroll accruing over time. So an increase in accruals, uh, we will have captured the expense because the, it's an accrued expense. So, so this is, uh, we have um, captured in the operating income an expense that we haven't paid yet. Um, so if our accruals go up, that means that we haven't, we have, have, we do have some expenses that we've captured in our operating income, like half a, half of a pay periods pay. Um, and we just haven't paid it yet. So in this case, this understates the amount of cash we on hand because the operating income, uh, looks like we've already paid our employees for that week, um, of, of, uh, labor that they that they've performed, but we actually haven't yet. So we add all these adjustments and and add the negatives, right? 
and we come up with an adjusted net cash from operations. So in this case, uh, Sunnyvale started with an, an operating income of 3.7 million. We made all these adjustments, the biggest one being depreciation, uh, and arrive at a net cash from operations of 5.2 million. So 5.2 million um, uh, in cash came into the organization as a result of operations. Now we'll look at investing um, activities. And so investing activities in this, in this uh, uh, include, um, well, there is no starting point. So there isn't, unlike the uh, uh, cash flow from operating activities, there isn't like an operating income here. Um, so there aren't adjustments per se. These are all uh, changes as a result of investing activities. Excuse me. Um, so first, we spent some money buying uh, new capital. So when we use the phrase capital, we're referring to some sort of um, long-lived asset, like we bought an additional building or we bought an additional vehicle or we bought some sort of equipment. Um, and so we've increased our uh, property and equipment by $9.3 million this year. Well, when we buy uh, property and equipment, the people that are selling it to us expect us to pay for it. And so, and they expect us to pay for it in cash. So when our, when our capital expenditures go up, um, our cash situation, our cash balances go down. Um, then we had non-operating income. So Sunnyvale had some sort of non-operating income. I think uh, it involved uh, some donations and some income from, uh, and some investment income. So since that's not included in the operating income, right? Because we use that as our starting point, operating income. Operating income does not include non-operating income. Um, so the non-operating income was the, was the, were the donations and the uh, income from investments. That is actually an increase in cash, right? Somebody was very nice and wrote a check to Sunnyvale and they gave it, they said, here you go. Um, and, and then the investments that they had paid uh, income uh, in cash to the organization. So this, so non-operating income in this case increases uh, the cash balance of the organization. Next, the organization took $5,000 in cash and purchased short-term securities. Now this is, none of these are necessarily bad things, good or bad things, but they basically said, you know what, we've got more cash on hand maybe than we need to have. And so they took some of the cash and they purchased short-term securities. So, so they converted cash into short-term securities that are hopefully going to yield some income to the organization, but it results in a decrease in cash on hand. Next, they spent $22,222,000 to purchase long-term securities. So they've moved some, some cash uh, and they've taken some cash and they've converted it into long-term securities. And so, so it's not that the organization doesn't have resources now, it's just that those, that cash resource has been converted into long-term, uh, a long-term investment. So when we totaled all that up, we have our net cash from investing. And the third section is cash flows from financing. And so here, um, we're looking at, so when we say financing for the cash flow statement, what we're talking about is getting uh, loans from a bank or, um, or maybe issuing new bonds. So in this case, uh, the bank, uh, they took out a notes payable. So, so um, this is pro a, a, probably a short-term note, um, less than a year in maturity for 989000 And then they took uh, and then they increased their long-term debt by 31 million, almost 32 million. So adding those together, so both of these, when you get a loan, what happens? Well, the, the bank gives you cash. So in this case, the bank gave them $989,000 in cash. And then they set up uh, some sort of long-term debt. So maybe a new bond issue and they received a payment of $31 million in cash, almost $32 million in cash. 
So cash flowed into the organization as a result of financing in a total of 32.7 million. So what we do is we take and add together the three categories. We take, whoop, we take the net cash flow from operations, the net cash from investing, and the net cash from financing, add the three together to get to a net increase in cash um, uh, coming into the or going out of the organization. So once we have the net increase or decrease in cash, we go back to the, to the balance sheet and get the cash balance from uh, the, the end of the last year. And so you can see they, they match up here. Right, so the cash balance at the end of 2014 is the cash balance at the beginning of 2015. Um, so we add the increase or decrease in cash, in this case it's an increase, to the beginning balance, and that gives us our ending cash balance. And so that's the, the cash flow statement. Um, so, uh, what do we learn from looking at Sunnyvale? Well, they had a positive operating income uh, 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 and depreciation cash flow. Um, so they had big chain, you know, they had three point, I think it was 3.7 million in, um, in operating income. You know, the big impact on the operating side was their 6 million plus in uh, depreciation, we add that back on and, and they have close to $10 million in operating income. And then we had some different adjustments based on changes in, um, uh, in, their, in their current uh, assets and their current liabilities uh, that are related to their operations. Then we looked at um, uh, the fact that they purchased both real property as well as financial assets with cash that had impacts on how much cash they had. Uh, um, and then, um, let's see, uh, oh, I'm jumping a little bit ahead. Uh, so we had, let me back up. We had uh, increases in receivables, right? Uh, decreases in payables, increases in accruals, right? And so uh, all these um, flows, resulted uh, in a large uh, positive cash flow uh, from operations. And this is in parentheses, doesn't mean negative, they actually had positive 5.2 million. Um, that's parenthetical rather than negative. Okay, the middle portion talks about um, uh, the changes as a result of investments. So they clearly, they bought a bunch of new equipment. They spent a, a lot on uh, new equipment. Um, they earned some some positive non-operating income, and non-operating income is not always positive. You can have a uh, you can have negative non-operating income. You can have a non-operating loss, say from something like um, uh, a lawsuit, right, um, uh, or losses on investments. Uh, they purchased a, uh, some new short-term investments, so they converted some cash into short-term securities, and then they converted a whole lot of cash into um, long-term securities. So, so uh, when you look at all the investment flows, uh, they invested 32.4 uh, million in fixed assets, so cash went down. Now, the last section summarizing, uh, uh, Sun Sunnyvale um, took on some short-term debt, um, uh, which, was, which results in an increase in cash, right? So when you get a loan, you're getting cash from a bank. And they use uh, and they increase their long term debt by thirty one million, so a significant increase in financing um, in debt financing, some current and some long term um, that brought in thirty two million dollars uh, in in cash into the organization so when they're all combined together um, uh, they, they had a overall positive cash flow. So the very bottom of the cash flow statement uh, shows uh, how much uh, uh, cash they have on hand that they can actually use to pay their bills. So what is the most important line on the statement of cash flows? Well, at the end of the day, what matters is how much cash do you have? Um, cash can come from, I think the lesson that you want to take away from this is cash can come from a number of different 
into the organization from a, and out of the organization from a number of different angles. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to know how much cash you have on hand. All right, so we're finished with the actual statements, um, both the balance sheet and the cash flow. Uh, I, we're going to conclude this discussion with two more ratios. So we ended uh, chapter three with a discussion of profit margin and um, uh, operating margin. I'm going to do two more ratios here uh, at the end of chapter four. The first one is the debt ratio, and the other one is the current ratio. So the debt ratio is a measure um, of capital structure. Um, and what we're looking at is, basically a per, what percent of the organization is, is financed by debt. Um, and, and, and the flip side of that is what portion of the organization is financed uh, by equity. Um, but we care about the debt ratio because it tells us how leveraged, how financially leveraged is the organization and leverage and the idea of like a lever and you're lifting something right. Um, uh, uh, debt can give us access to more resources uh, to perform our mission, but at the same time, it increases the riskiness of the organization, the risky, the, the riskiness of um, the financial risk of the organization, because at the end of every month or quarter or maybe year, you have to pay that debt, right? And um, so the higher your debt ratio, uh, the more risk you're taking on. Now that said, most organizations have some debt. Zero debt is not necessarily a good place to be because if you're a not-for-profit hospital and you're carrying zero debt, you're very financially um, stable, right? You're not taking any risk, but at the same time, you're not doing everything you possibly could for your patients. You are not um, using the resources that you have at your disposal uh, to do as much as you possibly could for your patients. So what's useful about a ratio, right, is you can compare um, your debt ratio, your organization's debt ratio to other similar organizations to determine, are you um, taking a average amount of risk? Are you being, are you being reasonable with your risk uh, uh, and reasonable with your debt? So um, is 65% a good ratio or a bad ratio uh, depends on what other organizations like yours have um, to determine whether you're take, you're more risky or less risky than other organizations. But debt ratio measures the amount of financial leverage that you're using and kind of the amount of financial risk. So the other ratio that I want to share with you, and there are many more in, in chapter 17 of your textbook, goes through a whole slew of both financial and operational ratios. But um, the current ratio is another useful ratio. This one focuses less on kind of, whereas the debt ratio is long-term and short-term debt, the current ratio gives us the ability to, to determine, are we liquid enough um, do we have enough liquid assets uh, to be comfortable and confident that we will be able to cover our immediate short-term liabilities? So we divide our current assets, which remember is stuff like cash and inventory that we can easily turn into cash, and we divide it by our current liabilities, which are our accounts payable, our accruals, um, and our short-term debt that we owe this year. And so we want to typically, we, we, we always want to have this be a number greater than one, um, but it but how big that number should be depends on again a comparison population. So, um, so is three point five good? It depends on what other organizations that are similar to you are carrying for a current ratio, and as well as you want to compare yourself to yourself over time. Now you don't want too high of a current ratio because that means that. You're, you are carrying too much, too many current assets uh, when they, those current assets could be invested uh, into either long-term investments so that you can earn uh, or have the opportunity to earn higher returns or 
it could be invested into, um, or it could be if you're a not for or if you're a for profit could be paid out uh, to other to your to your investors, or if you're a not for profit or for profit, that money could be used to buy uh, additional real assets like you know more uh, a, a bigger building or you know additional equipment to do your um, uh, mission better. Okay, so this concludes chapter four. We've covered the balance sheet and the statement of cash flows. Um, and so uh, if you are taking my class here at UNH, uh, 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 then, you know, this statement that, um, you know, everything in the book is, is required. If you're in the leadership program, uh, hopefully this has been a useful um, uh, summary of the material.